Building Frontiers, and I will serve as your host today. You can see on the screen Bella Engelbach, who will be presenting for us today. Bella is the author of Creativity Lean, How to Get Out of Your Own Way and Drive Innovation. Throughout your organization, was trained as a scientist and still loves the search for knowledge. Now she helps people to see that the heart of improvement is a scientific method. Bella is a creative problem solving facilitator who is also trained in continuous improvement, lean improvement, lean product and process development, and change management. She previously worked at Johnson & Johnson where she was a senior process excellence and business improvement leader, bringing the worlds of lean and creativity together in research and development, regulatory affairs, and IT implementations. She opened her own business, Lean for Humans Incorporated in 2018. Bella has a workshop scheduled for May 5th. If you have not yet checked it out, you can find it at leanfrontiers.com under workshops and online learning. Also, my camera is going to be on the entire presentation, so don't be alarmed to see us both. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Skyla, and thank you so much to Lean Frontiers for to this opportunity. And so what we're going to do today is we are going to talk about how we get more innovation into our A3s. And uh, we're going to talk about finishing the A3. And I'm hoping that most of you um, watched the uh, previous webinar where I talked about studying the A3. But if you didn't, I'm going to do a quick review of what we went over in that webinar before I dive into how we're going to finish our innovative A3. So the first thing that we talked about uh, in the previous webinar was about what's essential to being creative. And creativity actually requires a balance of two types of thinking. And some of us are better at one type of thinking and some of us are better at the other type of thinking. Now it often happens that people who are involved in lean and continuous improvement are better at one type than the other. And I'll tell you which one that is in a second. So the two types of thinking are divergent thinking and convergent thinking. And the interesting thing is that I've observed, this is not a scientific observation um, or, test, or a tested hypothesis, but I've observed that many of us who are attracted to, uh, to lean thinking um, really excel at convergent thinking. That is, we are good at selecting things, making choices, making things simple and clear for people. And we're often less comfortable with divergent thinking. So what is divergent thinking? Divergent thinking is when we are ideating, when we're coming up with ideas, when we're coming up with lots of different options, we're thinking of different ways to do things. It's when we allow ourselves to think broadly and expansively. And I like to think of this as being in the writer's mind. If you imagine this, you know, imaginary author of a fantastic novel who can just sit down and write and write and write and never stops to edit or interrupt themselves. That's divergent thinking. So, of course, then there's the opposite of that or the other, the other wing of the bird, so to speak. And that is convergent thinking. Convergent thinking is when we select or strengthen ideas or options, is when we make choices, we decide how to move forward. And another way to think of this is being in the editor's mind. That's when you stop, you look at what you've written or somebody else looks at what you've written and you start to move sentences around and you correct the grammar and you, you improve the, um, the work that's been done when the when you are actually sitting and writing so convergent thinking is about making choices and moving forward and improving and those of us who got in, into continuous improvement often really really um uh, are attracted to this style of thinking and i'm not saying that we're not good ideators in fact many of us are also good at divergent thinking but many of our, our tools in lean thinking kind of push us more towards convergent thinking. So then the next thing we talked about um, was about this, this very important concept that if we are going to be creative and creativity is required for innovation in our A3s, we have to be able to separate 
our diversion thinking and our conversion thinking. And there's a neuroscience reason for doing that, which is simply because each takes place in a different part in the brain. And our brains, even though we think we can multitask, apart from the fact that when we are breathing in and out and our hearts keep beating, our brains really can only do one thing at a time. We can really only think in one way or the other way. So when we are um, trying to think divergently and trying to ideate and come up with multiple options, as soon as we start to think convergently and decide what we're gonna pick or decide that we don't like an idea, we actually sort of dampen down our creative thinking. And so it's very important to recognize that you need both divergent and convergent thinking. And as much as possible, you need to recognize that it's important to do them separately. And I also shared that there are guidelines for divergent thinking and convergent thinking. I'm gonna dive more into these later on, but for divergent thinking, we always wanna defer judgment, combine and build ideas together. We wanna to seek wild ideas and we wanna go for quantity. And then when we are thinking convergently, we want to be deliberate about what we're doing. As we, do, we don't want to just pick something, we want to pick deliberately. We want to make sure that what we are picking actually is aligned to the objectives of whatever we're doing. We want to take time to improve ideas, just like when you're writing, you want to improve your writing. We want to be affirmative because being affirmative as opposed to being negative allows us to give ideas more life and of course, if we've come up with wild ideas, we really need to consider novelty and value novelty in our ideas. And then we talked about what is A3 problem solving and talked about the very important um, piece of A3 problem solving that is a coached approach. It's really, it's, a, it's at least a two per person game uh, to do problem solving using an A3. It's called A3 because we use a document the size of A3 pa paper or ledger paper in the US to tell the story of the progress of solving a problem. And A3 problem solving is very helpful in new product development or anytime you need an innovative solution to a problem. And it, this is, uh, it's kind of funny this morning, I was actually in a, in a meeting with um, some other folks and somebody said to me, you know, Bella, this, this, we've noticed this, that when people are doing A3s, they're getting very uh, typical, not exciting results from their A3s. Um, you know, that's something that, that we probably need to be working on. And so, you know, other people have been working on this too, but A3 is really helpful for innovative solutions. And um, so we, we need to understand how do we get that innovation out of our A3s? And of course, the book that we are, you know, that we've all been, uh, we all love for really learning about A3s is Managing to Learn by John Shook. And I'm sure John would be happy to know I'm advertising this book, but it's a really good book because it really shows you how the coaching works um, as you are doing an A3. So, we, so we've talked about, we've talked about the, the thinking styles you need. You've talked about what an A3 is. And, and we've also, we also talked about why you might not get an innovative solution when you're doing um, an A3. And I think there's just two simple reasons. The first is you might have ineffective divergent thinking. That is, you're not using, you're not getting as much out of your divergent thinking, or you're going, you know, you're going straight to convergent thinking. Or when you are doing convergent thinking in an A3, you are not doing that effectively and that you are violating one of the guidelines, which means that you are probably throwing out the innovative ideas before they even have a chance to breathe. So then we went through an A3. And so what you see here is what we talked about um, in the first webinar or everything that is on the, this of the beginning of your A3 problem solving, what is on the left side of an A3, the background, uh, current conditions, goals and target, and the analysis of the problem that you're working on. We talked about how you might use divergent thinking and convergent thinking in each of those uh, stages of your A3. So now it is time to move on to the right side of the A3. And if we're really lucky, I'll be able to move my slide. Okay. This is what you're doing an A3 for, right? You're doing an A3 because you want to come up with some innovative countermeasures. So what's a countermeasure? A countermeasure is an intervention 
that you are going to put in place to address the root cause of the problem that you're solving. And it may, it may be more than one intervention or tool or, or product that you're going to use, but, um, but countermeasures, um, they're not, um, I don't wanna get into a long, a long discussion of the difference between countermeasures and solutions, but in continuous improvement, we always wanna have the idea that whatever we come up with can be improved later. It might not be the ultimate solution, right? So, but, so what are our countermeasures? So very simply, the big question and what really drives innovation in A3s is the divergent thinking in this stage when you are really thinking about what are the all the potential countermeasures. And I use the word all very, very deliberately. Now you're probably not going to come up with all the potential countermeasures. But when you set that goal of really looking for a good set, a good number of countermeasures to the root cause of your problem or the root causes of your problem, that will drive you to come up with a longer list of potential ideas or options. And then of course, we're gonna do our convergent thinking. Which of these countermeasures have the best chance of success which should be combined, which is the simplest. Now, in lean thinking, this is where you will find from lean and Six Sigma, we have a vast number of tools to help us select and decide how to move forward. And you gotta look at those tools very, very carefully to make sure that you are not accidentally killing innovation. But before we do that, let's talk about some sources of countermeasures. The first thing that you happen, that will happen when somebody brings you a problem to solve, um, assigns an A3 to work on, or you sort of assign yourself an A3 to work on, is you will probably automatically start to say, think of some ways to solve the problem. That's great. That's fine. I always tell people, if you think you have a countermeasure or a solution on the first day you're writing on the A3, working on A3, fabulous. You're already starting to think divergently, but you are gonna think divergently. You're gonna keep looking. So I always say, go ahead, write it down um, in that section for countermeasures as a potential countermeasure. You don't know yet if it's gonna work, write it down, but don't stop there. What I also hope that you will do as you are working on your A3 or you're coaching someone who's working there on the A3 is that you will allow some uninvited ideas in as well. So what's an uninvited idea? One of the interesting things about our brains is that we, it's very hard for us to actually force ideation. Like it's very hard for us to sit down and say, all right, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to, I'm going to have 10 ideas. I'm going to set a goal. Um, and in the next five minutes, I'm going to write down 10 ideas. Now, some of us kind of practice that stuff and we get better at it, but those probably are not the highest quality ideas. So where do the highest quality ideas come from? Those are the ideas that come when we're actually not thinking about our problem at all when we're just allowing ourselves time to think. Those are the ideas that will come and think about this. You probably know this is true for yourself. These, those are the ideas that come when you are out walking. Those are the ideas that come when you are brushing your teeth. Those are the ideas that come when you're chopping vegetables. Those are the ideas that come when your brain is is not necessarily actively um, working on solving the problem, but your subconscious has continued to work on solving the problem. So as those uninvited ideas pop up, make sure that you add them to your list. Now, the other thing that will happen when you start in A3 and you go around and you, you do this work of uh, Nemawashi, of, of sharing that A3 and, and laying the ground for making the change that you're eventually gonna make, uh, you will hear other people give you ideas. And you will probably hear some of those ideas and go, oh my gosh, that will not work because that's gonna be your natural fight or flight reaction to somebody else's idea. 
but you should probably write those ideas down too. And you should ask people more about their idea. How do they think it might work? So you're going to start to generate a list of countermeasures even while you're working on the, the left side of your A3. So before you get to the right side of the A3, if, you are, if you're doing this right, you should have um, some, some kind of seed ideas to start your countermeasures section. And again, the uninvited ideas from the people that you didn't necessarily want to weigh in, there may be some gems in there. Another place to look for ideas for countermeasures is actually in the wider world. And one of my favorite things to do is, where, is when I'm trying to solve a problem is to take it outside of the environment that I'm working in and ask myself the question, what is this like? What is, is this problem we have with, with something that's getting queued up? Is it kind of like visitors at an amusement park? No, is it, is it like um, kids lining up for school on the playground and they don't want to line up? No, what is it like? How has that problem been solved? Because the interesting thing is that many, many problems have already been solved, but they may have been solved in an environment that's different from yours. And so to bring an idea in from somewhere else, adapted to your environment, that's innovative for your business, for your industry, for the, for the way that you work. And it may just be the innovation that you need. So when you're working on an A3 or solving any problem, keep an eye out for something that you might think has nothing to do with how you work, you might see it, I, the, the spark of an idea for a countermeasure right there. And so what you wanna do is keep growing that list of countermeasures. For those of us who really got into continuous improvement because we really like convergence, it's going to be easy for us to want to stop. But I would encourage you to keep growing that list all the time that you're working on your A3. And again, you, you want to be deliberate. Remember those ground rules. You want to be deliberate. So you want to eventually pick things that actually have something to do with solving the root cause of your problem. So what, what are the guidelines that you need to have in mind when you're doing this? You need to be really, it's a divergent thinking process. So you do want to defer judgment. You want to combine and build ideas. What if we did this and this together? We want to seek those wild ideas. We need to get comfortable hearing things that sound crazy and writing them down. And we do want to go for quantity. And so that creates opportunity for us because somewhere in that list of kind of measures you've developed, there very well may be an elegant and simple and innovative solution waiting to be tested. But it's also the most dangerous part of the A3, because this is where the fight or flight reaction to novelty is the most likely to kill a potentially innovative countermeasure. So why is that? And that it's because at this point, now you're starting to think about, and other people are starting to think about, what if we actually implemented this? This is not just a paper exercise. We're gonna use this solution to do something. And it may actually tread on somebody's toes it may disrupt somebody's way of working. It may, you know, may change things in a way that people don't necessarily like right away. So it's a very dangerous place. And it's very easy for someone to, to react in a fight or flight, I don't like it, it's a bad idea way, um, and give you some very coherent excuses for why it's really not, why something's not a really great idea. So in this convergent thinking stage, when we must actually pick from that long list something to try, we need to be deliberate. We need to be carefully checking our objectives. We need to be working on improving our ideas. We need to be affirmative, which means we need to look at ideas and look for the good in them. Look at what they could lead to. Look at the opportunities they might generate for us. We have to value and consider novelty. If something's novel, makes us uncomfortable, let's, is rather than saying that feeling is being uncomfortable, let's say it's, it has a little sparkle for us. But there's one more thing, and this is really where lean thinking, I think, really, really differs from the field of creative problem solving. Because we know that if we really want to find out if something works, we have to test it, right? Again, this is not a paper exercise. So we really want to get to the point of running some kind of an experiment 
with our countermeasures, whether it's a simulation or some type of real life experiment. So we want to be able to pick some that we that we think are worth testing. Now, this leads to a really interesting conundrum, because remember what I said was we want to keep divergent thinking and convergent thinking in general separate. Now, what happens, though, from a lean perspective is if we get a big list of ideas and then we decide to test those ideas, what have we done? We've created a big batch, right? And in lean, we're not happy with big batches, right? So perhaps what we might want to do is to get some ideas, test some of them get some more ideas, test more of them, get more ideas, and, and so on and so forth. Um, obviously, this you don't want this to be a never-ending cycle. You want to come out at the end of this with some ideas that you're going to move forward. And the question is, so which do we do? do we, Bella just said, get a big list of ideas. Um, uh, you know, because, and the reason I said that is because I want you to stay in a diversion thinking space when you're coming up with countermeasures, right? I don't want you to be stopping and going into convergent thinking and then missing a potentially innovative idea that might be just what you need. So my answer is kind of going to be yes. And the way to evaluate an idea to for ready to be tested is to look at an idea and say, how quickly, is this an idea that we can test quickly, get an answer on quickly? Um, in a way, design a killer experiment, decide are we going to move forward with this or not? So yes, get a lot of ideas, but also be evaluating those ideas and see which ones can you test um, as soon as possible. So my answer for that, which is probably not helpful, is yes, kind of do both. And then we, when you think about how to test, and this goes for the other places in A3 where you need to do testing. The question that I like to ask is what is the fastest, least costly way to test this and get reliable results? Now that's really coming out of my background in the pharmaceutical industry. It does us no good in my business to do testing that does not give us reliable results. So designing a test is just as important as picking what to test. So we want to think about, again, divergent thinking. What are the possible ways to test this? This is a great place to do some research. Who's tested something like this before? What did they do? Do we like that test? Do we think that test will give us a reliable result, at least good enough to move forward with? And then convergent thinking, which test or tests should we use? Now I have a picture here of the right flyer. And the reason I have the right flyer is always is to remind me, this was the, the first uh, um, powered aircraft uh, built by the Wright brothers, to remind me that the Wright brothers to build this aircraft actually not only had to design the aircraft, they also had to build and design and test the testing equipment for the aircraft. So sometimes the test you need is not going to be available, but you're actually going to have to design the test in order to eventually uh, test your solution. So just something to remember, just because a test doesn't exist, if you really want innovation, you may have to design the tests as well as designing um, the solution you're coming up with. Here's a very important additional point. <laughs> when you're actually running the test, just run the test. Run your experiment. Do not engage in divergent thinking, right? right? If you want a good, well-controlled experiment with reliable results, just run the experiment. You can think about it divergently afterwards um, as you're trying to understand what happened in the experiment. And, um, and so finally, um, you have gone through your countermeasures, you have, you have uh, tested countermeasures, hopefully you found um, an innovative countermeasure that will actually um, deliver the results. You've deliberately picked something that will deliver the results that you're looking for, and now you need to implement it. I just want to point out in the plan section of the A3, I always tell people the plan section, you could use that to plan whatever you want all the way through working on your A3. But here we're focusing on your plan for how are you going to implement. And again, think divergently. What are all the potential barriers to Im for implementation? Convergent thinking. Which of these barriers do we address first? What action should we take? And then we think divergently. Again, we're testing. What are the ways we could pilot our implementation plan? And then we think convergently, what actions must we take first? And then this is actually the most important part of the A3. 
and that is the follow-up section. The follow-up section is where you are going to write down what is everything that you've learned in solving this problem. Now, when you think about everything you've learned and going through all of these sections of the A3 and all the people you talk to and the tests you've run and the ideas you come up with, it's probably a ton of stuff and it's not all going to go into your A3. So you want to think about which learnings, convergent thinking, which learnings are the most valuable to document and share in this A3. Other stuff may go into a, data, a database, um, it may go, go into a lessons learned document. There are lots of places to put your learnings. So why? So what? Wouldn't it be a waste if you learned something solving this problem and that knowledge got lost and somebody else had to learn it again? So you really do want to make, uh, make sure you have a really good follow-up section. So just to wrap up very quickly, again, what's essential to being creative, a balance of these two types of thinking, Divergent thinking and convergent thinking. You can think of those inside a PDCA cycle. Uh, in the plan stage, you think divergently and convergently. When we're actually doing something in PDCA, we just execute our experiment. When we are studying the results of our experiment, we're gonna think divergently and convergently. And when we're choosing how we act or adjust to move forward, again, we have opportunities for divergent and convergent thinking. So we have this heartbeat going on throughout our uh, PDCA cycle, which is we're kind of running behind our A3. So remember, finally, A3 is a coach process. So it's important for the problem solver and the coach to plan for divergent thinking and convergent thinking and to ask coaching questions about how people are thinking. Are you thinking in the right way now? Do you need to think divergently or convergently? And for both the coach and the learner to follow those guidelines. Okay, so if you would like to get some hands-on practice and learn more about building creativity in your A3s, as Skyla said, I'm going to be running a workshop on May the 5th. I would love for you to join me. Uh, you can go to leanfrontiers.com to check that out and register for it. I'd also um, be super, ha super happy if you read uh, my book, uh, which is called Creatively Lean, How to Get Out of Your Own Way and Drive Innovation Throughout Your Organization. And that's where I talk about how you use divergent thinking and convergent thinking in many different uh, lean approaches. So um, thank you very much for uh, spending time with me today. Skyla? Thank you so much, Bella. I really liked your heartbeat slide. Thanks. You're very welcome. Thank you to everybody who participated today and thank you for Bella for joining us again. Please make sure you do check out her workshop on May 5th. Have a great day. Thanks. Goodbye, everyone. Bye, Bella. Bye.